appear in this matter with Mr. Cardew, the appellant, uh, the official receiver, and I'm going to adopt the usual shorthand and talk about the OR through the course of my submissions. Uh, Mr. Herberg and Mr. Assassin appear for the respondent, Shop Direct, and Shop Direct is the financial services business of the very group. Uh, there is one issue before this court, and it concerns the proper interpretation of a provision in the dispute source book within the FCA handbook. Uh, and I shall refer to provisions within that source book again, uh, apologies for the jargon, as DISP, just for convenience as we go through. And the issue is this, where the official receiver as trustee in bankruptcy brings a complaint in relation to mis-selling of PPI, payment protection insurance, held by a bankrupt, is the relevant awareness for the purpose of DISP 2.8.2 R2B of the disputes source book that of the OR or that of the bankrupt. Now, this is a pure point of law. Uh, the parties are agreed that the decision on this is binary, one or the other, not either or both. And this is recorded by the judges, as the court will have seen in the judgment below. Uh, also, on this question of law, the parties are agreed that nothing turns on the identity of the OR. Uh, the OR is in no different position on this question to any other trustee in bankruptcy. Uh, one point, just of clarification at the outset. Uh, the court will have seen that both parties refer to mis-selling. Uh, and under that label, both parties include both uh, mis-selling properly, so-called, i.e. at the time of sale, things going on with the sale, but in particular unfair commission as well, which is subject to a separate regime. Um, the precise meaning of mis-selling is not an issue that need trouble this court on this appeal. Uh, but by way of um, non-exhaustive examples, uh, it could be, for instance, PPI being added to a loan or credit product without the consumer knowing. It could be the consumer being pressurized to take out PPI. Uh, it could be the consumer taking out PPI when the product was unsuitable for that consumer. Or it could be the question of uh, an unreasonably high level of commission uh, being charged. Uh, moreover, the result of any particular mis-selling complaint, of course, will depend on what regulations or guidance or good practice was at the particular time. And to that degree, clearly, there are going to be many factor-sensitive elements in relation to any specific mis-selling question. Now, the judge below, as you saw, decided that the awareness is that of the OR, uh, and the OR appeals with the permission of the judge. Before going further, just to deal with housekeeping, um, <coughs> although I have a wall of papers here, I shall be trying to deal with things on the electronic documents in the usual way they're there, just in case the electronic doesn't work as intended for me. So uh, the court may be in a similar position, but starting with electronic bundles, uh, there would originally have been an electronic core bundle, a supplementary bundle, and an authorities bundle. Uh, the authorities bundle in hard copy extends to two uh, volumes. Mm -hmm. Replacement skeleton arguments in the usual way were filed and incorporated in the core bundle. But subsequently, uh, once the authorities bundle had been agreed, uh, both parties last week put in additional copies, which you may have it therefore separately, with the authorities references included. Mm -hmm. um, they're there for the court's assistance, but they're not incorporated. It, it, it may not. Speaking for myself, I certainly got yours. I'm not sure I've had Mr. Herbert. I don't think it matters. I was about to say, I'm sure if there were a difficulty, it could be resolved, but I don't anticipate there would be any problem Thank arising you. out of it. Uh, then, in addition, uh, yesterday, uh, a slightly updated supplementary bundle was filed, uh, both, I believe, in hard and soft copy. Uh, that was to add a few more pages to a technical manual. And speaking personally, I'd already marked up the existing electronic bundle, so I'll be continuing to use that and have a separate copy to the extent necessary in relation to additional material. Uh, there was no opposition from the official receiver to that additional material going in, uh, though, speaking on behalf of my client, we're not persuaded it will assist the court significantly. Um, both parties had suggested pre-reading uh, my friend's suggestions went somewhat further than ours in terms of the line documents. 
I, I, I shall assume, and, and this told otherwise, that the court will have taken the usual approach and done, done, done what it can. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I will focus, therefore, on highlighting things rather than reading everything, of course, out of the basin. Uh, one, one small point to pick up as an additional point at the outset. Uh, the, the, the court uh, may be um, interested in knowing what the position of the FCA and FOS is in relation to this appeal. Uh, we made no specific mention of this in our skeleton, but my learned friend very helpfully did in his. And the essential position is uh, that they are monitoring. They've, they've been offered the opportunity to take part in these proceedings, uh, but have chosen uh, not to do so. Uh, they, I anticipate, will be in attendance in some form, either in court today or watching the live stream. But beyond that, uh, there, is, there is nothing. The subject to the court, um, that's all I wanted to say by way of general introduction, and I was going to move to the... Yeah. Um, before you embark on your substantive submissions, th th there is one question that um, at some point perhaps you or Mr. Herbert can assist us with, uh, which is that uh, in the original claim form, the claimant was seeking an alternative declaration, uh, which I think was to do with a suggestion that even if the relevant knowledge is um, the uh, consumers, if I can use that for shorthand, uh, that the knowledge of the OR could be attributed to the consumer. And, and, and I noticed that that was the subject of some written submissions, at least, in the claimant's skeleton argument. But it doesn't, I'm not sure if I've understood the procedure correctly or what happened at the hearing, but it, I, I imagine it wasn't pursued because the judge, I don't think, addresses it. Um, if I can put it <coughs> this way, my learned friend in oral submissions, I think that the phrase he used was described it as being very firmly on the back burner. Right. Uh, and certainly he was making no active case. Uh, I should say, well, of course, he didn't formally drop the point, it remained there, but it, but it wasn't something he was actively seeking uh, to put submissions on before the judge. And, and, and I anticipate, my lord, you're, you're identifying particularly that sub-aspect of the, the other declaration, uh, because, uh, of course, the main thing that was being sought was by reference to the official receiver's uh, knowledge in respect yeah. to the technical manual. Uh, which, which, which went hand in hand, if you like, with well, the first day. It may be helpful if we can perhaps just look at. Yes. 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 Well, if, we, if you don't mind, <coughs> just so, you, so I can explain what, what it is that I, I was talking about. The, there's an agreed list of issues before the High Court which is in the core bundle at page 114. It's tab 13 for those who are working on tabs. Do you have that? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um, again, very much looking to you and Mr. Herberg for help at an appropriate juncture, because obviously we weren't there, we don't know what happened. But uh, so far as we can discern from the documents, there was an agreed list of issues and when we go to page 115, paragraph 1 at the bottom is the first issue, and that is the issue which is uh, principally, at least, the subject of the judgment and therefore the subject of this appeal. Um, but if we go to page 116, uh, paragraph 3, it was said on Shop Direct's behalf, the, sec the second limb of that, uh, subparagraph two, if the relevant awareness is that of the bankrupt, whether it is the case that the bankrupt would have become aware or ought reasonably to be aware that he had caused a complaint at the time of bankruptcy or shortly thereafter. And then 
it was suggested that points that may arise in answering these questions include paragraph 4, subparagraph 2. If awareness of individual bankrupts is what is material, whether awareness on the part of the OR can or should be attributed to individual bankrupts, and if so, on what basis? And it was, it was particularly that subparagraph 2 that, speaking for myself, Mr. Gibbon, I, I wasn't sure to what extent that was a live issue before the trial judge. Um, I don't think he addresses it in his judgment. No, and, and while your lordship was speaking, I've also been trying to look through my notes because I did make a note at this point, thinking your lordship might ask. Right. And um, our, our notes on this was that it was day one of the hearing at pages one nine seven to one nine eight, which your lordship doesn't have, but the transcript does exist. Right. Um, the judge had asked my learned friend about whether it was not abandoned but on the back burner, and my learned friend says firmly on the back burner. One has to be realistic. Uh, and again, that was mentioned on Dave's view at page 316 uh, uh, by me, saying that the other side had stopped short of saying it was abandoned because <coughs> it was on the back burner and we'd have to deal with a moving target. Um, implicitly, if nothing else, we would respectfully say that it's probably rejected by the district judge because he refused to make any further declarations for the yeah. award. Is that, is that right? Because it's it's put in a list of issues as only arising if the relevant awareness is that of the bankrupt. And the judge obviously has come to the other conclusion. So he may have, rather than reject it, simply thought it didn't arise. I, I, I think it, that, that would be a possible interpretation, but for the way the argument has gone, I would respectfully say, because the, the judge had described it as being, um, I would say, not abandoned but on the back burner. So the judge hadn't regarded it as something that was the subject of live argument and certainly wasn't the subject of extensive submission by me. Uh, and also, I'm reminded by my learned junior that it is touched on briefly in the judgment. That's tab nine of the core bundle at page 97. Yes. Uh, and what the judge said of the second limb of this additional declaratory relief was not advancing all the submissions at trial. Touched on. Uh, but that's a different point. Which paragraph are you reading from? A paragraph 65. Yes. Yes, I, I, I noticed that, but like my lady, I, I thought that was about a different point, but, but I may be wrong. 64 talks about timing of actual awareness. Yes. One goes back to what the limbs of the relief sought were. Seeing whether that's in the decision or in the skeleton argument. Yes, um, that was yes, I'm not sure it takes things much further. It's page 92 mm. of um, the skeleton. Yes. As I said, I'm not sure it takes no, much further. No. But, 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 Mr. Gibbon, uh, you've been very helpful so far. I, uh, I, I, I also noticed that although there is a respondent's notice in this case, at this point, as far as I can see, it doesn't in the respondent's notice. Whether that leaves us procedurally, I'm not sure. Uh, it may not matter at the end of the day. And I certainly don't want to take you out of turn in, in the way in which you present your submissions. But uh, it's a point that uh, we may need to come back to. Yes. Uh, I, I, I suspect, and again, without guessing out of sequence, I suspect that might be a difficult one to come back to, certainly in this forum. Um, obviously, one of the uh, one of the submissions being made below was that in relation to the factual declarations, if I call it that, was that they were simply not appropriate matters to be the subject of declarations at all. Yeah, I understand. And uh, certainly, the way we've apprehended it is the judge was presented with uh, requests uh, by the, the two claimants. I, I mentioned, of course, that there was another claimant which settled. Yes. Uh, for de declaratory relief. And of course, the granting of declarations is a matter for uh, the 
discretion of the court ultimately for various reasons. Yes. Uh, and uh, if you like, formally, by not making any further declarations, that was an end of the matter and left the franchise to appeal them. And my friend didn't appeal them. The only, the only issue on this appeal, therefore, is whether the judge was right for additional reasons in this case to those that the judge himself gave. So that's certainly how we've apprehended things. But certainly, if this court uh, considers there are points in due course which arise which need further consideration, <coughs> the parties uh, the parties will take that very seriously. I, mean, this, I, I should perhaps mention this additional point, that it has been raised both by Mr Justice Bryan at the CMC in November 2021, mm. as well as the judge last year, the question of what happens next. Mm. Uh, and doubtless that will be in the court's mind as well. Mm. Uh, and uh, clearly, in the light of whatever is decided, the parties will have to have further discussions because, uh, for various reasons, which again needn't trouble your lordship, there are other things which might need to be resolved. And finding the correct approach to resolving those correct route uh, will, will, will take further course and discussion. Yes. Well, as I say, Mr. Gibbon, um, I certainly don't want uh, you or indeed Mr. Herbert to uh, take things out of order. Um, there, there may well be you know, good reasons why the matter wasn't pursued, at least as no bigger, it seems, in the court below, but no doubt we can hear about that in due course by Mr. Herbert. But I think that um, what you should do is, if I may say so, open your appeal in, in the way that you uh, think fit. I'm very much obliged. In, in, in the light of uh, your Lordship's um, helpful interventions, uh, I'll, I'll also take further instructions if necessary on that, Thank just you. to see if there's anything else which the court yes, that would be helpful. Thank might you. find useful. Um, the structure of our oral submissions, uh, broadly speaking, there are, there are seven things I'll go through. First is to outline relevant provisions of FISMA. I'll use that abbreviation, which is the, the standards and apologies if other people have other abbreviations, um, both as enacted and in current form. And I'll come to why that, that, that's useful in a second. Secondly, I'll then turn to look at the general section and the glossary of the uh, FCA handbook. And general, yet again, there's an acronym, which is GEN, as your Lordship will be well aware. <coughs> Thirdly, uh, I'll touch briefly, and this, this won't be contentious ground, I, I believe, uh, authority relevant to the correct approach to interpreting this. Uh, fourthly, I'll go through relevant provisions of this. Fifthly, the role of the official receiver as trustee in bankruptcy. Uh, sixthly, how the official receiver said that dovetailed with the provisions of this. And then, seventhly, seventhly for want of a better title, is the, uh, inverted commas, right to complain itself property. So in, in that, we'll be addressing the way the judge, uh, the judge put it in the judgment. So um, it broadly follows the, the shape of our skeleton, but obviously it emphasizes uh, perhaps more detail to, to assist your, your lordship the court in, into <coughs> getting into Yes, well, that's very helpful to have that outline. Thank you. So, uh, just by way of general introduction to the provisions of FISMA, uh, the provisions which currently apply have applied, for the most part, relevantly since 2013. And that was part of the consequence of the restructuring of what was the FSA into two parts to form the FCA and the PRA, so the, the Provincial uh, Regulatory Regime, and the PRA is, of course, the Bank of England. Um, that necessitated some quite major surgery to FISMA. Um, but by way of uh, reassurance, if you like, I wanted to show the original legislation to show that, in, in essence, nothing of any substance has changed for the purposes of this court. Uh, as the court will be aware, FISMA is one of the most substantial pieces of legislation on the statute books. 
as enacted, it was 433 sections and 22 schedules. I haven't been able to find out how many sections it now has because so many of them have letters after their names that it's actually impossible to try and work it out without sitting and counting them in person. I haven't tried that. Um, it was associated with a myriad of statutory instruments and it has been subject to regular surgery down the years, not just the substantial sort that I just mentioned, but also lots of minor changes, in particular in response to European legislation. Um, against that background, just to turn to FISMA <coughs> as enacted, you find that within authorities have five.
briefly subsection 6, a complainant is eligible in relation to the compulsory jurisdiction of the Ombudsman scheme if he falls within a class of persons specified in the rules as eligible, and so one sees their straight interrelationship with the, the rules that were being developed at the same time. Uh, and, and finally, subsection 8 simply uh, gives the shorthand, this is where you see it, to find out who's within the compulsory jurisdiction. So that's as much as I wanted to show you of the original material. And uh, moving through to FISMA as currently in force, that is found at tab 4. disputes may be resolved quickly and with minimum formality by an independent person. 
The scheme is to be administered by a body corporate, the scheme operator. The scheme is to be operated under a name chosen by the scheme operator, but it's referred to in this Act as the Ombudsman scheme. And Schedule 17 makes provision in connection with the Ombudsman scheme and the scheme operator. And of course, the actual scheme operator is the uh, International Ombudsman Scheme Limited, uh, generally abbreviated with another acronym, so FOS. And again, I, I, I will, unless told otherwise, use that abbreviation. The compulsory jurisdiction uh, section at 226 is unchanged essentially from what you saw before. Again, there have been some minor additions, but I don't need to read that out for you again. Uh, in, in essence, uh, one sees that, for instance, electronic money and payment services have been added as a result of European legislation since, uh, since the original Act was passed. Uh, but again, those jurisdictions would know relevance to the Treasury Administration. Uh, I don't need to show you the detail of Section 227, uh, which concerns the voluntary jurisdiction. The, the only thing to note, perhaps, is that it to a large degree mirrors <coughs> the compulsory jurisdiction, and actually when you get to this, it was a deliberate drafting choice, but as far as possible, there should be no differences drawn between the compulsory and the voluntary jurisdictions. As I say, that's really just by way of general, uh, general relevance. Section 228 is found on page 58. Now, this is a, an important feature of the way the Ombudsman scheme works. Determination under the ju compulsory jurisdiction. A complaint is to be determined by reference to what is, in the opinion of the Ombudsman, fair and reasonable in all the circumstances of the case. When the Ombudsman has determined a complaint, he must give a written statement of his determination to the respondent and to the complainant. And then there's provisions in four as to what the statement must contain, uh, including requiring the complainant to notify him whether he accepts or rejects the determination. And if the complainant notifies the ombudsman, this is subsection five, if the complainant notifies the ombudsman that he accepts the determination, it is binding on the respondent and the complainant and the final. Then uh, I should show you 229 as well in relation to awards. And you'll see again in subsection 2, uh, if a complaint which has been dealt with under the scheme is determined in favour of the complainant, the determination may include an award against the respondent of such amount as the ombudsman considers fair compensation uh, for loss and damage of a kind falling within subsection 3 mm -hmm. suffered by the complainant, money award, a direction that the respondent takes such steps in relation to the complainant as the ombudsman considers just and appropriate whether or not a court could order those steps to be taken. And a money award may compensate for financial loss or any other loss or any damage of a specified kind. And there is a provision in five for a limit to be set, and that, that crops up in some of the cases, so I do mention it now. Uh, a monetary a money award may not exceed the monetary limit, but the Ombudsman may, if he considers that fair compensation requires payment of a larger amount, recommend that the respondent pay the complainant the balance. Now, for many years, the, the limit was £100,000. In respect of the, the matters which have been referred by the OR to Shop Direct, uh, the limit would be £160,000. That, that's for emissions before the 1st of April 2019, but referred after that date. But, uh, again, for your Lordship's note, uh, the maximum amount now available uh, since last year is 375,000. So the figure's gone up significantly. And that's all flowed from consultations that took place. Again, nothing turns on it for the purposes of this decision, but, but it, again, it gives you a flavour of this being a, a mobile area, if I call it that, in the background. And 
one final thing to draw attention to. <coughs> it's a minor point, but on page 63, uh, you'll see that the, the, the FOS scheme is essentially a confidential scheme as regards the individuals. Uh, that's section 230A. And uh, subsection 3, unless the complainant agrees, a report of the dissemination published by the scheme operator may not include the name of the complainant or particulars which, in the opinion of the scheme operator, are likely to identify the complainant. And uh, just to say we don't seek to place too much stress on that, but again, that's consistent with dealing with individuals, consumers, and sort of providing a simple regime rather than the stress, the publicity, whatever it might be of going through court proceedings with all the incidents that those uh, bring with them. In general, the breach of rules is actionable in court, but the suit is a consumer for breach of statutory duty, and unless the FCA specifies otherwise. That's section 138D, my lord, yes, which you should not be aware of. Um, and that, that's, again, breach of rule. So one has to bear in mind, of course, that a lot of what one sees when you go through this, for instance, is, is guidance <coughs> rather than rule. Well, I was going to, to ask, are the sort of mis-selling complaints which have been brought before the Ombudsman, um, or the, against Shop Direct, the sort of complaints which would involve allegations of breach of the rules which could be? The subject of actions? Uh, the short answer for today is uh, I'm not able to give a precise answer. They will in some cases, without doubt. But certainly I, I wouldn't say, on the other hand, that. Not necessarily in every case. No. I mean, for instance, it, uh, you know, I can put it this way yeah. the Ombudsman can find a complaint made out if there was no breach of the rules or no breach of the law. Yeah. There might simply have been what the Ombudsman regarded as some uh, unfairness or some, some practice. Um, the, the ombudsman's discretion therefore is a very different beast, if you call it that way. But there, there is the overlap that your lordship has referred to. Thank you. As I say, it's, it's one of the, the challenges with the, the nature that these proceedings have taken. But so I'll, I'll stand back and say this: that there was a debate uh, prior to the launch of these proceedings by the other claimants. I'm not going to mention the name; it's, it's not formally confidential, but there's no need to mention the name. But um, as to whether declaratory relief was the appropriate way forward, and my client had suggested that a, a different route might be to have test cases in relation to particular <coughs> facts. Mm. And we haven't got correspondence here. Uh, we, uh, we did complain in our evidence about the route that was taken, uh, but we didn't formally object of the Part A claim in the commercial court. So, so you know, we are here, and we had the opportunity to object. We didn't. That was on the basis of proceedings had been launched. That was in the middle of 2021. Now, subsequent to that, uh, my learned friend's clients issued their proceedings, uh, which, to, to an extent, and I'm making no criticism of this, but they muddied the water slightly, because the first, the first claim was simply for the legal declaration. And my friends sought to tack on to that for reasons which your lordship may you know, may appreciate. Mm. Um, well, while we're there, can we get these factual matters dealt with? And obviously, the judge decided no, and that's not this is not been proceeded with. But, but, but we'd obviously said in response to Shop Direct that you know, we didn't consider anything which raised factual matters as being appropriate to deal with by way of declaratory relief. So, to, to, to quote, we perhaps wouldn't have wanted to start here for today's hearing, but we, we are where we are. But, but, but the, the issue uh, is brought into sharp relief by questions such as my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent, uh, where there are issues in a particular case, one can see that if there were test cases, one could say, well, this one, there's a, there's a complete overlap with Section 138D. It's all about the rule. But what about this case, which 
which doesn't. And that's a very long way of answering that for today's purposes, I, I'm not able to assist hugely further on that. So, uh, so to return uh, to the Act, I was then going to turn to Schedule 17, which is found at pages 70 and forwards. I'm sorry, just picking up on the point I raised, just so I've understood it. The consumer makes a complaint to the ombudsman. The ombudsman produces an award or rejects the award. The consumer is not bound to accept it. He's got a complete choice whether, if he accepts it, then that's binding. And yes. That means he can't then sue for the same complaint. But if he rejects it, he presumably, if it is a 138D case, can launch proceedings. My, my lord, yes. Uh, and again, I don't think there's an authority which says as much in terms, but I don't think there'd be any. Uh, disagreement between myself and my learned friend in relation to that. It, it is an ADR procedure. It has to comply with, with a regulation dealing with ADR. And to that extent, uh, I, I, without uh, having taken any detailed time over this, would suggest that it would have no relevance to whether a claim for breach of statutory duty was or was not successful subsequently. That's that's well, it's, it's, yes, sir. No. I was going to say, not all ombudsman schemes are like that. I'm familiar with the pensions ombudsman scheme, and if you get an award from the pensions ombudsman, that displaces your legal rights because it's binding on both parties. It's not a voluntary decision whether to accept it or not. But this scheme, it seems to be a choice solely for the consumer, not for the respondent. Do I accept what the ombudsman has given me, in which case that's it, and I can enforce it through various enforcement mechanisms, or do I think that's not enough, and then I'll take my answers in court. My, my, my Lord, indeed. And, and to, to build on that with two, two further thoughts. First, this is a scheme into which the consumer, to use that as a, as a shorthand, can opt. The, the financial institution cannot opt into it. It's purely the consumer's choice. And secondly, in relation to uh, the questions of what happens when you get a, a, a judgment, or what, when you accept a determination, I apologise, there is, of course, the Critchley case, which my friend has referred to, and no doubt will be developed in his submissions in due course. But that was a case where an award had been accepted. It was an award for £100,000, which was then the maximum, but with a recommendation in line with the legislation I've just showed you that a larger amount should be paid. And the, uh, the consumer, with the benefit of advice, accepted the £100,000, but with a reservation of rights, and uh, then subsequently for proceedings, I think it was essentially the case that they regarded the £100,000 as a fighting fund to allow them, therefore, to pursue the subsequent larger claim. And that's, that's my friend's raised due to Carter case. I apologise. Apologise. Uh, Clark. Yes. My, my, my mistake. Uh, but that, that's, that, that's the raised due to Carter point, because having once accepted with all the consequences which my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji has referred to, one was into a very different situation. Thank you. Right, you were taking us to Schedule 7. Yes, my Lord. And page 70 is paragraph uh, 1. There, there's a reference to ADR entity. That's because the rules have built into them, or the schedule has built into it, a requirement that the POS meets the requirements of that, uh, that set of regulations. And an ombudsman is a member of a particular panel. The panel is the panel established uh, under four. And you see there, again, it's, this, is, it, it, this is moving to paragraph two the interrelationship with the FCA. The FCA has a sort of supervisory role in relation to FOS. The FCA much take, takes such steps as are necessary to ensure that the body corporate established by the F SA under this schedule as originally enacted is at all times capable of exercising the functions conferred on the scheme operator by or under this act. And so the FCA, when making rules or approving rules, is fulfilling that function, that's in subparagraph three. And they have a duty.
duty of cooperation with each other. This is, again, not controversial. Bottom of page 72, paragraph 3A. But the next thing I think I need to take you to is some pages on at, yes, paragraph 13, which is page 78 of the authority bundle. And that says this at 1. The FCA must make rules providing that a complaint is not to be entertained unless the complainant has referred it under the Ombudsman scheme before the applicable time limit determined in accordance rules has expired, or B, and B is not uh, relevant for this purpose. That deals with consumer redress schemes, which don't, don't affect the, the case. And moving on to paragraph 14, this refers to the scheme operator's rules. So this is rules made by POS. Scheme operator must make rules to be known as scheme rules, which are to set out the procedure for reference of complaints and for their investigation, consideration, and determination. Scheme rules may, amongst other things, specify matters which are to be taken into account in determining whether an act or omission was fair and reasonable, <coughs> etc. Uh, but I, I certainly wouldn't, for today's purposes, be trying to spend any time trying to draw out distinctions between the different origins of different rules, because if you look down to 4, uh, 5, and 6, that's 3 to 7 on the next page, you'll see that the scheme operator works closely with the FCA, and nothing gets published by the scheme operator unless the FCA has consented. <coughs> uh, it is, uh, I can put it this way, a complete minefield trying to identify in any particular case what relevant powers might have been used. <coughs> and luckily, between my, my friends and I, neither of us have found it necessary, looking at Mr. Herbert for confirmation, to try and do that as part of this exercise. And I'm glad to say is, is nodding. So, but again, technically in the background, one needs to be aware that there are different sources of law. And, uh, and again, I didn't show it to you, but paragraph 16 says that money awards are, are recoverable as if payable under order of the county board, again tying in with my other report, Justice Nugent's um, question just now. Although slightly oddly, it appears that in Northern Ireland and Scotland that's automatic, but in England and Wales only if the county court so ordered. My Lord, I, I can't comment on that <coughs> other than to note, as the Lordship has, that that is the position. So, that, that's my first, uh, my, my first head of the, the seven that I gave you earlier. Yes. And I was going to move on next to the FCA handbook and the gen and glossary uh, sections. Now, for this purpose, we go to the supplementary bundle. And before turning up a particular page, Again, just to stress the context we're in here, the FCA handbook is enormous. No, nobody has it printed out anymore because it's all online and so its sheer scale is disguised by the fact you can leap around by pressing hyperlinks. Uh, but it is enormous. The court will no doubt have had occasion to look at it before. Um, a conspicuous feature, apart from the sheer size, is the use of defined terms in the glossary. Uh, and these are found italicized through the handbook. And one often has to spend time flipping uh, backwards and forwards to understand precisely what is going on in respect of a particular expression or word. Uh, and that ties in with a broader point that construing the handbook is an iterative and contextual process. Uh, so with those general points in, in the background. Um, <coughs> yes. there, Mr. Gibbon, just before you move on, you, you, you mentioned the size of the handbook. Uh, I think it would be helpful for members of the court to have access to it. Electronically will be fine. I wonder if a link could be sent to us. I'm, I'm sure that can be arranged by somebody in court while, while I'm speaking yeah. today. Uh, it, 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 as I say, it, it, it's online. Yeah. Uh, also, 
So the parties haven't made uh, particular use of it at this level. Um, it has a uh, wayback machine element to it, so you can find uh, what the law was. So it's certainly fa fairly uh, accurately, though it may take you some time, going right the way back. So you can choose, say, the 3rd of March, 2008. Uh, and so... Uh, getting ahead of myself slightly, but uh, one of the points I'll be making is that the relevant provisions of course can be confident have remained the same throughout, but they um, have found themselves supplemented slightly in certain places, or for instance in relation to this DISP 2.7, that was originally DISP 2.4 until 2008 <coughs> or thereabouts. Um, my, my friend and I have both worked on the basis that what you've got in the bundle is as printed out for the trial last year. But say so we, we do that offering your lordship, you know, your ladyship, the assurance that, as far as we can see, uh, everything that was material to the conclusion, the determination of this appeal, is found in the currently available material. Thank you. And what is the relevant date that we should? Should be looking at it's the date when the complaints were, were brought. Is it? Well, the, there are two answers to that, my lord. First, in terms of when the complaints are brought, unless there's a provision telling you otherwise, that will simply be dealt with by the financial. I should perhaps look at it in the two stages. It will be referred to financial institution first. The financial institution must deal with that according to the current guidelines. And if it decides against and the the complainant wishes to refer to the FOS scheme, it will then be dealt with by the FOS scheme, and the FOS scheme will, amongst other things, look at what the financial institution has done. But the second part of the answer is that, of course, there, there, there comes a subtlety, because depending on the date at which a product was missold, there may be a difference as to what general standards, general guidance was, as to what was appropriate. Um, I, I don't elaborate that too far because I, I, I'm, I'm speaking of peace here slightly, but um, while the simple answer is you just deal with it under the current scheme, what answers produced by the current scheme uh, will depend. And I, I gave the example earlier, for instance, of what the, uh, what the level of award might be. Now, under the current, current rules, it will depend in part on what the date of the actual original mis-selling was and when it was referred because there's a series of transitional provisions that can go in. So I hope that's more help than hindrance as a response. Yes, can I understand the procedural stage at which these complaints, I mean I think the skeletons say that there's a very large number of them, but I don't think we've been given the number. Um, but there was a bulk complaint put in by the OR to shop direct, and that's where we are, because the the complaint, if it's out of time, the respondent doesn't need to entertain the complaint, and we haven't got to the stage of bringing a, a complaint to the ombudsman. Is that right? Yeah, in broad terms, yes. Uh, and, and the reason I say in broad terms is that obviously there was a great deal of correspondence. A again, getting ahead of myself slightly, in two thousand and seventeen, there was a change to the rule in effect meant that all historic PPI mis-selling complaints should be referred by the end of August 2019 to the rule. And the court will recall uh, the quid pro quo of introducing that, that deadline, that new deadline, was a massive expensive advertising campaign to try and pe give people a chance to identify whether or not uh, one last chance they had had PPI, and the FCA's approach was that um, people were encouraged to think about PPI they might have had at any stage. Now, it was in the context of that, this isn't, again, before, we, before you in detail, that the official receiver uh, made what he described as bulk complaints to various institutions, and um, we do have figures in relation to the other claimants, if it's a settled claimant, and your Lordship has seen from that very, very substantial numbers of both individual complainants concerned, individual consumers, and even 
larger numbers of accounts. And we're once talking many, many thousands. So, um, albeit one doesn't know the figures for shop direct, they haven't been put in evidence. Uh, I think my friend Holly said loads that they are very substantial. Well, that's in fact very large. That in fact clearly is sufficient, if, if you like, for shop direct. Uh, and uh, also tied in with that, thinking about shop direct as one of many, many institutions, there was an extraordinary. Um, pile up, if I can call it that, in 2019, because so many things had been raised in so many different quarters. And what happened was discussions took place between parties about uh, when steps should be taken, uh, the financial conduct authorities involved with that, and in response to, to that, different institutions made different arrangements in relation whether time limits should be extended voluntarily or was it by agreement. So the position in relation to shop direct, I haven't got the, the paper here, but um, they would say one of the points they reserve, and it's not raised, is whether or not those complaints were properly referred to them by the end of August 2019, but they don't raise that as a, an issue for debate in this forum. But, but factually, shop direct has not rejected any of the under 1.81 of, of this. I, I don't believe any have been so, rejected. So the reaction has been, so, so they could have rejected without considering the merits on the basis of limitation, um, provided they explained that position. But we haven't got there here. Their, re their response has been to issue these proceedings. And uh, well, along with many other institutions, <coughs> there were ongoing discussions, as if I could put that at the most high level, understandably ongoing discussions. And it's in the context, as your ladyship has said, of those that, uh, as no resolution was reached, uh, their proceedings were launched. And as I say, in part, I suspect that's because they knew that the other proceedings had already been launched and it seemed appropriate to try and have the two sets of proceedings dealt with together. Uh, I, I should stress, if, if there's anything about this that I'm saying that Mr. Herbert disagrees with, I, I'm sure I'm very happy to, for him to give him the floor on that. But I hope, in general terms, that there was material before the judge below which would have given a more detailed answer to your ladyship's question, your ladyship's question. But I hope, in general terms, that gives you a feel for where we are. Thank you. Right, so I think you were going on to Jen and the glossary. Uh, yes. Supplemental bundle at 62, there are a series of provisions in GEN. And just show that those in turn 2.2.1R, so a rule, every provision in the handbook must be interpreted in the light of its purpose. 2.2.2G, that's guidance. The purpose of any provision in the handbook is to be gathered first and foremost from the text of the provision in question and its context among other relevant provisions. The guidance given on the purpose of a provision is intended as an explanation to assist readers of the handbook. As such, guidance may assist the reader in assessing the purpose of the provision, but it should not be taken as a complete or definitive explanation of a provision's purpose. Then I think I can take you to 2.2.6 at the bottom of the page. Use of defined expressions. Expressions with defined meanings appear in italics in the handbook unless otherwise stated in individual source books or manuals. And then moving to 2.2.9. Again, guidance, unless the context otherwise requires, or unless otherwise stated in a particular source book or manual, where italics have not been used and expression bears its natural meaning, subject to the Interpretation Act. Um, uh, we have one section of the Interpretation Act in the bundle, but we don't have the whole of the Act. Now, um, as my friend has made 
some submissions in relation to it. Perhaps if I just make some observations here at this point. On 2.2.9, it's part of a suite of interpretation or provisions in GEN, all of which are to apply. And how much assistance <coughs> is to be gained from it will, we respectfully say, vary greatly. And perhaps in, in a normal way, the phrase natural meaning might give the, the superficial impression that there was a single obvious natural meaning. Now, that may, of course, be the case in respect to a particular provision. Uh, for instance, the king in a UK context would naturally mean the king of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, not some other king. Uh, but the idea can be an elusive one. Uh, a word may have a variety of possible meanings, all of which are natural in context. So uh, that's not to say that the, uh, the guidance has no relevance, but we respectfully suggest that the primary task remains to understand the scheme for the relevant legislation and the, the meaning of that expression within the scheme. <coughs> and just as in the wider statutory interpretation context, Gen 2.2.9 doesn't require an a priori search for a single natural meaning. That would be to mistake what comes into what is clause. And uh, I've already drawn attention to the fact that the interpretation act was referred to. If you look at 2.2.12. further reference to that. Now, in Do you place reliance on subparagraph 1 at all? Of subparagraph 1 of 2.2.12? Yes. Well, my, my, lord, my lord, yes. Uh, I will be taking you in particular to a couple of definitions and how we say that they should be interpreted and, and colour the way your lordships and the leadership look at provisions in, in dispute in blue courts. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a holistic exercise. I, I, I wouldn't want to take any one of the provisions within GEN and try and give it an over-emphatic presentation to the court. Mm. Uh, I, I simply drew out the points in relation to natural meaning just to uh, ensure that it wasn't regarded as having some sort of trumping or more particularly, an a priori quality, uh, which, which we consider would be an, an error if that was uh, how it was to be understood. Now, in broad terms, the provisions can be said, if you like, to, to replicate general principles of statutory construction. Uh, and uh, we, we certainly don't disagree with that. It's one of the difficulties, I suspect, that there was regarded, and I'll put that neutrally, there was regarded as being a need to say something about interpretation. I, I, I can't give you a definitive answer why, and my speculations may be of no assistance, but it may be that, that because of the style of the handbook, that was felt to be an important feature because it's very much a consumer-facing, non-legalistic-looking text. It has legal importance, but it's, it's a very different drafting style to what you might see in an act of parliament. And it may be that in certain respects, as rules and guidance are given by FOS, for instance, uh, that's not a, an obvious judicial source, a judicially recognized source uh, for legislation. Uh, but I, uh, I, I stress that I, I put those observations, which may or may not be of assistance. I don't place them reliance on those by way of submission. The, the short answer Can I, is... Can I be sure I understand? Insofar as the handbook contains rules which are marked by an R, the rules made in exercise of the rulemaking power conferred by prisoner both on FOS and on the Ombudsman, is that right? Uh, yes. And so those are delegated, this, they are subordinate sort of uh, legislation, it, it, yes, technically. And, and, and that's it, that, that is an important point we, we say. But they're, we not, they're not made by statutory instrument. Mm -hmm. the, 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 they're made through the processes you showed us a bit of, the consultation and draft exposure and so on. But once once they're made, they, they're, they do have statutory force in the sense that 
then made as rules yes. under the Act. Presumably the guidance is not technically subordinate legislation at all, it's just guidance. That, that's that's correct. This is where it, it, I mean this this could be a whole separate hearing, I suspect, with yes. a lot more material needed. But the, the, the guidance, um, I mean, Mr. Herberg may have more to speak to it than me on this. Gu guidance can have a force, bearing in mind its statutory origin that his lordship has identified. But I, I simply don't have. You use the word minefield in a different context earlier. Yes. I think many public lawyers might describe this as another major. Y yes, and that's which, why which I think we probably don't need to get into in this appeal. Well, th that would certainly be, be a, a matter of some relief, I suspect, to take myself from a friend, not least because we don't have the full materials which, right. which right. we need right. to assist yeah. the court properly in relation to that. Um, but there are instruments which bring these matters into force. Those instruments aren't necessarily parliamentary instruments, though, and again, that's a separate discussion. If it were of any assistance, no doubt we could produce notes just giving a little bit more uh, guidance from, from, from the bar as to the architecture and how that architecture works. Well, I suspect, unless either of you could say it makes any difference, we won't, speaking for myself, need to get in, into it. I was just prompted by your submissions as to the broad principles of statutory interpretation. Are we technically interpreting something which has statutory force, and it seems to me that technically yes. we are insofar as they are rules, including in particular the relevant rule, but we might not be insofar as we're interpreting guidance. Yeah, I mean, if I can put it this way, the key provisions with which you are concerned are rules. It's 2.8.2. 2.8.2, and to the extent it has a bearing on 2.8.2, 2.7.1, etc. So I, I will gratefully accept uh, my Lord Bishop Singh's suggestion that in, unless it crops up as being something which the court decides on further reflection in his guidance, uh, I, I shan't particularly dwell on, on a difficult issue <coughs> such as this. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned there was one provision of the Interpretation Act. Uh, just I'll, I'll show it to you very briefly just so that you know it's there, but I'm not sure that any submissions will turn on it. That's in the authority bundle, tab one at page four. Turning to the supplementary bundle, uh, this time looking at 65. Yes, now this is the glossary. This, this is the glossary. And again, uh, when, when the court has the, the relevant link, I think I did once try and print the glossary out, and again it was a very, very large document. There's some guidance yes. on the glossary of definitions, but in essence, that simply cross refers to what you've already seen in Gen. So I don't think any paragraph four really repeats what we've already read. Yes, and so I don't propose to read that out no. to the court. Uh, and then moving to bundle page 69, yes. there one sees the definition of complaint. Relevantly, in subparagraph two, uh, 
any oral or written expression of dissatisfaction, whether justified or not, from or on behalf of a person about the provision of or failure to provide a financial service, etc., which alleges the complainant has suffered or may suffer financial loss, material distress, or material inconvenience, and B, relates to an activity of that respondent or any other respondent with whom the respondent has some connection, etc., which comes under the jurisdiction of the FOS. There's no relevance in what was deleted in the subparagraph one? No. I haven't got it here, but I've looked at that in the past and came to the conclusion there wasn't any relevance. And it's paragraph two we're concerned with, not paragraph four. Is that right? Paragraph three, that's in fees 7A and fees 7B, or have I missed? Oh, there are two paragraph threes. I'm looking at the wrong paragraph three. Well, you read us paragraph two. Yes. And I understood you to do that because that's the one that's relevant. It is. In fact, we don't have the whole of the paragraph three that's referred to there. Okay. That's fine. That's common ground between us as well, my friend. Now, complainant is... Just before we leave that, sorry, you're moving on to complainant. Within that, I was going to say complainant is not a defined term. I was going to make that point. The complainant is not a defined term, but nevertheless we are given some indication of what a complainant is in this particular provision because it says the complainant has suffered or may suffer financial loss. Your Lordship's ahead of me. That's the very point I was going to draw to the Court's attention. So it's, if you like, an indication that one sees from that use of language in context there. And it is an important... Yes. It is an important provision. And I think you would submit that it's also important that in the previous words, this provision has already made clear that that person is not necessarily the person who makes the oral or written expression of dissatisfaction because it says from or on behalf of. My Lord, that was my second point, and your Lordship again is ahead of me because that's indeed the case. There is a clear distinction between the complainant, if that complainant uses somebody else, because that person does it on behalf of. The from and on behalf of language is an important indicator, we do say, when assessing someone's going forward. Person is a defined term. We don't have a definition of person. Do you know what it is? It's elsewhere. It's quite complicated because it cross-refers to delegated legislation. But in essence, a person is, in its significant part, it's an individual, a private individual, but it's not limited to a private individual. It could be a company which was in, if you like, the position of a customer. But there are various provisions that would need to be met in relation for a non-private individual to meet the test of what a person is. Is the OR a person? I'm not sure that that has been addressed. The OR is a statutory office occupied by a person. By 16 individuals. By 16 individuals. My lady is ahead of me. I'm sorry, my junior is mentioning something. If I can perhaps put it this way, the official receiver occupies a particular office, but the official receiver, although it's the shorthand one uses the name, in any particular case will be an individual person. That slightly gets into the territory of minuscule data, which I'll come to in due course, as to what the precise juridical nature of the official receiver is. I don't think I've quite understood. Is it your submission that when the official receiver makes a complaint, which is a defined term, that that is a written expression of dissatisfaction from a person or on behalf of a person? Oh, I see. Our submission is that's on behalf of a person. On behalf of a person. So 
for the purpose of this definition, your submission is the OR is not the person that is making a complaint on behalf of the person, and the person is the bankrupt. Yes, and you, uh, my, my lord, you, you'll see that when I get to develop my submissions in relation to <coughs> 2.7.2. And one of the points that 2.7.2 goes to some trouble to explain is that uh, the, the person who acts on behalf of somebody else, if I can say that in loose terms, doesn't need to meet any particular criteria. So they're not bound by the, uh, the separate, uh, separate question of what sort of person would fall within. <coughs> they don't need to be an eligible complainant. They don't need to be an eligible But so, but I hope that, that eventually has got to my clarification, namely that the official receiver's case is that it acts on behalf of. And when I say that, perhaps I should stress this: um, the official receiver, it's an officer of the court. It comes to a view what it considers the legislation means. It, 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 I don't think relate to particular emphasis on our client status, but the official receiver has the view that it acts on behalf of, within the meaning of this. And that's the critical question, obviously, for this court, is what is the meaning of this, and what's the proper application of this in the, in the circumstances we now face. Is it, in fact, in dispute that under Rule 2.7.2, the official receiver that who brings a complaint is acting on behalf of the bankrupt? Um, it depends how far one dives into that question, because it's certainly one of the submissions being made is that uh, the official receiver has vested in him or her. It's a shorthand, I'll say, I'll say him. But the official receiver has vested in him uh, all the rights, including what is described as a right to complain. And it certainly has been uh, suggested in even if it's not at the forefront of my current submissions, that thereby the official receiver is acting as the complainant. But as I say, I, 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 if I could perhaps most usefully address it by virtue of what the official receiver's submissions are, yes. and that, that, that may be a question more from a, from yes, a friend. I, I would certainly find that helpful. Thank you. So moving on to the next page, a much shorter definition found in the middle of 70. Eligible complainant. <coughs> a person eligible to have a complaint considered under the Financial Ombudsman Service as defined in DISP 2.7 brackets is the complainant eligible? Question mark. So pausing there, uh, that uh, dovetails with what you've seen already in section 226, subsection 6, and without turning that up, you'll recall that was a complainant is eligible in relation to the compulsory jurisdiction if he falls within a class of persons specified in the rule as eligible. And the glossary <coughs> really comes at that from a different angle, but again confirms that one looks through to 2.7. So if you like, that triangulation simply confirms the position found in the underlying legislation. Uh, we've already seen what complaint is in the glossary, and it, my Lord Lord Justice Singh has already uh, identified the two particular points which I wish to stress in relation to that. And uh, We've seen what that definition demonstrates about the characteristics of complainant. Uh, we do say it's noteworthy, and I wouldn't put it perhaps higher than this, that they have chosen in the glossary to use the phrase, or adopt the phrase from the heading, is the complainant eligible? Question mark. Now, there is no suggestion that after that initial question has been answered, there is any relevant concept of a non-eligible And 
not only does that tie in with what you've seen in section 226, because it's a necessary part of access to the whole scheme that you're an eligible complainant, but also, as we'll see in, in due course, uh, that ties in with DISP itself, which shows that one of the four key matters necessary uh, to be within the scope of the jurisdiction is the eligibility of the complainant. So as we've put previously in this matter, uh, if the complainant isn't eligible, then DISP is not engaged. And if DISP is not engaged, then obviously it's open to the financial institution when it receives some sort of expression uh, simply to reject that out of hand. So that's what I wanted to show in relation to Jen and the glossary. And it was at that <coughs> point I was just going to broaden the, the camera angle, if, if you like, uh, to look at authority uh, relevant to the correct approach to interpreting this, so going, going beyond uh, what was said in Jen. Um, I've referred already to the general principles of statutory construction. Uh, I, I'll touch very briefly on some case law. Um, with appropriate diffidence, I was just going to show the court the Mawson case, which is found in the authority bundle. And that's at tab 20, starting at 36. And no doubt your, your lordships and your ladyship will have come across this case before. It was a fairly complicated arrangement in relation to capital allowances legislation and a substantial gas pipeline. The facts are of no relevance whatsoever to this report today, if you're pleased to hear. I simply wanted to show you two short passages at 3712. Is this the, uh, the sidelined passage? Yes. Yeah. And it's really, that's the first part of the <coughs> sidelined passage in 28. As Lord Stone explained in McGuckian, the modern approach to statutory construction is to have regard to the purpose of a particular provision and interpret its language so far as possible in a way which best gives effect to that purpose. I think the rest of that paragraph doesn't doesn't particularly illuminate further, but also in 29, there are some indented words of, of Lord Wilberforce, yes. uh, as so often very pithily expressed, uh, what are clear words are to be ascertained upon normal principles, they do not confine the courts to literal interpretation, they may indeed should be considered the context and scheme of the relevant act as a whole, and its purpose may indeed should be regarded. So, so that's partly to uh, really um, elaborate on the submission I made already about how Jen reflects the general statutory interpretation provisions. And I, I, I recognize that the, the judge below, paragraph 31 in his decision, said there was no difference between the parties as to the principles applicable, and he particularly referred to the LBIE decision, the Lehman Brothers decision in relation to CAS 7. Uh, however, what he said was quite short there, and although we agree with the judge that statements do not alter the substance of the interpretive guidance set out in, this, uh, in, in the, the handbook, uh, we respectfully say they go somewhat further in a way that's, that is of some use to the court. Uh, not least because they recognise that, um, in a way perhaps that unsurprisingly isn't found in the handbook, that there will be infelicities from time to time in uh, a document of the nature of the handbook, given the scale of what it's trying to do, the, the nature of its drafting statements, etc. So, um, to make that point good, if I can ask you within the authority bundle to turn to page uh, sorry, to tab 22, but within that, page 465. And it's the sideline passage 
within the judgment of the master of the rolls. And again, the, the court may be familiar with this passage. What he said was this. Um, at the risk of appearing anodyne, it appears to me that when considering how to interpret CAS 7, the following factors are relevant. First, CAS 7 must be construed <coughs> in the light of its overall purpose, namely to protect the client money held by a firm. Secondly, CAS 7 must be construed on the basis that it, that it is intended to produce a practical and commercially sensible result. Thirdly, and I don't suggest this is relevant for our purposes, uh, it is to comply with directives and, and in, in, impose and implement those. Fourthly, if at all possible, different provisions of CAS 7 should be interpreted coherently and different points at issue should be resolved mutually consistently. Fifthly, while such general points are of cardinal importance, the actual wording of CAS 7 must ultimately govern any decision as to its effect. And he then turned to the issues. Um, so, so we do, do commend that uh, set of observations. Um, we don't have the Supreme Court decision, because as, as the court will recall, that went to the Supreme Court. It, we, we had it below. Uh, there was no doubt thrown on those principles. Uh, if you wanted a reference to that, uh, that's 2012 UK SC 6. Uh, but I also wanted to show you within the decision uh, some observations of Lady Justice Arden. Yes, back quite a substantial way to 398. First of all, paragraph 18. 1398. The interpretation of particular provisions of CAS must be an iterative process, but one has to begin somewhere. I propose to, to summarize the provisions of CAS 7 by taking them in an order in the order in which they appear. Uh, there, there is a degree to which that is true in this case, as, as the court will already have seen. One does find oneself bouncing backwards and forwards to a degree. And uh, as regards iterative, uh, certainly what we apprehend she means by that is that wherever you start, you start your knowledge will be imperfect and you need to keep circling back to the tense sheet. And also, if I could ask you to turn to page 405. Now, there's a longer sideline passage here. We, we do say this is of uh, some importance in elaborating the, the points that were uh, recorded by the judge. Uh, I, I will, with your um, indulgence, re re read it out and pause at particular points. Um, the issues on this appeal turn upon the interpretation of the statutory rules of CAS 7. The process of interpretation of CAS 7 involves assessing the provisions as a whole and testing preliminary conclusions on one provision by reference to the rest of the relevant provision. We must, as the judge, and that was Mr. Sir Justice Briggs at first instance, recognise the an holistic <coughs> and iterative approach to interpretation. There is a danger of compartmentalisation if issues are split up and dealt with separately. Accordingly, I sought to condense them as far as possible and to test my conclusions by reference to the rules of the scheme considered as a whole. And then she goes on to say this at 58, and it, it, it very much um, picks up the point made by my Lord Justice, or, or Justice Nugi. Uh, although CAS 7 looks like and is a set of rules for market participants <coughs> and investors, it is also a set of statutory rules. In my judgment, the presentation of the rules in this form serves to remind the court that the rules must be given a sensible and practical construction. The court must bear in mind the overall scheme of the rules and keep in proportion any drafting infelicities. Since the rules are designed to protect investors, uh, see uh, Section 138 of the Act set out, the court should lean against interpretations which result in legal black holes. The court has at least to start out with the view that the drafter intended to create a coherent scheme, even if this is ultimately disproved in certain respects. The rules should also, in my judgment, be taken to be granted in reality. Uh, the Act requires the rules to be the subject of detailed and far-reaching consultation in the market prior to adoption. Thus, uh, improbable, the FSA was oblivious to the fact that mistakes were worse than made by firms in practice. The, the, the remaining part, I don't think, assists the court so much. And in 
the uh, in the light of the approach you see in the Lehman Brothers case, um, again, without giving it undue prominence, we say there is a discernible strand of consumer protection uh, in the relevant legislation we have here, just as there was in relation to CAS 7, where the, the circumstances of CAS 7 were, of course, very different. Uh, a focus on the underlying customer, which is threaded through the drafting of this with respect to BSA. Uh, it's how to resolve disputes, but in a way that is intended to extend important protections to consumers, uh, to, if you like, protect and vindicate their rights. Uh, and again, picking up on the point that we already addressed, it is conspicuous that it is something which the consumer often sees, not the financial institution. And uh, it is up to the consumer, again, as expressed earlier, as to whether or not there is acceptance of an award under the system. Um, the judge, uh, I needn't ask you to turn it up, but he uh, encapsulated some of the features very helpfully in paragraph 16 of his decision. I'll just, just read out the relevant passage. He said, the purpose of POS is reflected in DISC is to provide a consumer-facing, user-friendly, free-of-charge process for seeking redress without recourse to formal legal proceedings. And in, in very short form, we certainly have no quarrel with what was said there. Now, I was next going to turn to relevant provisions of this, but, but there's one matter of housekeeping which I didn't raise earlier, and it's occurred to me over the last few minutes. When we were below, we had live, live stream, and it turned out afterwards they would have liked the break. Uh, but we hadn't given them one. I haven't actually raised with my friend this morning, I apologise for that, whether or not he knows whether that's the case today. Sorry to have raised it then, but we, we, we were told afterwards that they would have liked to break, but yeah. apparently they've got arrangements in place that a break is not necessary. So I'm All right. subject to the court. I'm very happy to carry on. Thank you. So I, I was then going to go to this, which is found in the supplementary bundle again. <coughs> and it's at uh, page one. Yes. And just to stress uh, what I said earlier, this is DISP as it currently stands, Al albeit when you go to the, uh, the website of the FCA, not only do you have the benefit of a time machine, but you can also see when things were introduced. Uh, unfortunately, the printed out version doesn't say when things were introduced. Wh where I think that might be relevant, I'll, I'll, I'll mention. but. Um, Unfortunately, not something that we can easily resolve today on the material in the bundle before, before the court. Mm -hmm. right. So there's an introductory section to this. I'll just read a few particular passages from that. This part of the FCA handbook sets out how complaints... Uh, I'm not going to try and speak with italics, but when, when, you, when you read uh, through, you will, uh, you will see italicised wor words, and they are, they are many-fold. So you can see straight away that, that the practical exercise of going through the glossary, if you really want to understand every single provision that's on there through. How complaints are dealt with by respondents uh, and the financial ombudsman service. Then, uh, third paragraph, the powers to make rules and directions or set standard terms relating to firms, etc., derive from various legislative provisions, but the rules uh, have been coordinated to ensure they're identical wherever possible. So that, again, ties with, with an observation I made earlier about the voluntary jurisdiction and the compulsory jurisdiction. As far as possible, they look the same in the rules. And, uh, in fact, the same provisions can apply to, to, to both. Uh, there's then a brief summary of the chapters. So chapter one, treating complainants fairly. 
This one contains rules and guidance on how respondents should deal with complaints promptly and fairly, including complaints that could be referred to the FOS. So, again, there's a distinction drawn between what can be referred to the FOS and what can't. And then in the next heading, the Financial Ombudsman Service, after the first sentence, it says, Chapter 2 sets out the scope of the Financial Ombudsman Service to jurisdictions, the compulsory jurisdiction and the voluntary jurisdiction. The scope of the two jurisdictions is defined by, and these are the four elements I mentioned earlier, the type of activity to which the complaint relates, the place where the activity took place, the eligibility of the complainant, and the time limits for referring a complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service. And moving on to the following page, the penultimate entry in the left-hand column, Appendix 3, FCA's Rules and Guidance on Handling Payment Protection Insurance Complaints. This appendix sets out the approach which firms should use when handling complaints relating to the sale of payment protection contracts, so in essence PPI. And I should say that that was introduced in 2010, Appendix 3, but obviously for the reasons given, if a complaint is now being referred and dealt with, it calls for these to be considered as part of dealing with that complaint. So moving on to page 3, as I say, this is this is disc 1, treating complaints fairly. Uh, that includes keeping uh, respondents informed, keeping com complainants informed. And 1.6.2, subject to uh, a later rule, the respondent must, by the end of eight weeks after its receipt of the complaint, send the complainant a final response, which does various things, uh, including at letter E, informing the complainant that if he remains dissatisfied with the respondent's response, he may now refer his complaint to the Financial Ombudsman Service. When you look at 1.6.1, which requires the respondent to send a complainant to prompt written acknowledgement and keep the complainant thereafter informed. Does complainant now mean the ombudsman at the OR or the bankrupt? Well, one of the submissions I'll come to is that once one has identified, and that it involves going through the whole process of looking at this, but once one identifies how the, the paradigm case is meant to work, which obviously focuses on the complainant, in a case where there's no supervening bankruptcy or other matter. It's very straightforward. Yes. Uh, where, for instance, uh, you have an agent involved, we say that it, it's, it's a natural use of language that didn't need to be set out expressly, that it would be sufficient and consistent with the overall purpose that one can send the response to the agent. That would be sufficient sending to the complainant that doesn't undermine the identity of the complainant. Now, I'll elaborate that as I go through, but um, but your lordship picks up on a point which uh, we would ultimately respectfully say comes into the question of the infelicities that can arise when one starts with a, a scheme that's focused on individuals, and the vast bulk, no doubt we're anticipated to come directly from those individuals. But then, entirely properly, it's made allowance for other circumstances which have been bolted onto that. And that's, if you like, your Lordship's question gets to the heart of uh, the sort of issues that, that we are beginning to grapple with more closely now that we've got into so this. When you say that does not undermine the identity of the complainant, <coughs> you mean that does not undermine the identity of the complainant for the purpose of 282? Yeah, but, uh, that, or, you know, generally what it means is that the complainant it is sufficient sending to the eligible if it is sent to the person who's referred to the complaint. I see, so actually, you mean across the board it doesn't undermine the identity of exactly. the complaint? Exactly. I see. So what the respondent has to do is actually send it to the OR, not to the bankrupt. But you say that is still a sending we to the bankrupt. In, in, in terms of understanding the scheme, we say that is where you ultimately get to when you see how the scheme's been put together and how it operates. Um, as I say, the, the, da 
danger is by dealing with it at this stage mm -hmm. before I've shown you all yeah. the other material. I may get right. ahead of myself in a way that's going <coughs> to get, get out of sync. This but is really the point that Lady Justice Arden was making, is that it's important to read the rules as a whole. And you may have a provisional view by looking at one provision, mm -hmm. but you can test it by looking at everything. My, my, my Lord has put it extremely well. And, and it is that exercise which I'm hoping to, to do over the next period of my submissions. Yes. And really, as we draw the threads together, having once gone through DISPA the, as a whole, to see how it fits together. But obviously, I, I have given some immediate response to Lordship's question, which I hope indicates the direction of travel, if nothing else. Yes, all right, thank you. Uh, but but I'm, I'm deliberately showing you on the way through as were points that might be put against me. Because I do well, want this to is not a point that might be put against you. It's a point which is put against you it, at exactly. the very forefront of, of respondent submission. It, so you read the rules. When you get to this rule, it must mean that the response is sent to the OR and not the bankrupt. There's no point in sending it to the bankrupt. And equally, if someone's died, you can't send it to someone who's dead. So it must mean send it to the OR. And I think your answer is, yes, it has to be sent to the OR. But that doesn't tell you who the complainant Yes, that's certainly uh, with, with, without. I hope without sounding I'm too too sceptical about that. I'm, I'm always conscious that there, there are there are there are more aspects that are, that are brought into it. But th let's let's put it this way: um, th there, there are many different permutations we might have to look at. For instance, in relation to agency, we've got a situation where the uh, the complainant is CY Juris. The complainant has chosen to use an agent to refer the matter. Now, it actually might be the case there, just as a matter of practicality, that um, you could have a, a choice if you're the, the firm as to whether you send it to the underlying complainant, that wouldn't be wrong, or to the person who's been appointed to refer the complaint. Uh, similarly, in relation to a bankrupt, we, it's a point we've made below, it's not perhaps highlighted, in these submissions, but there is no legal objection, there's no nullity if the bankrupt refers the complaint. The bankrupt is alive, the bankrupt can put a complaint in. In fact, the Ward case was a good example where a bankrupt, a former bankrupt, did put uh, something in, and the question actually arose afterwards, what to do with the money? And it was the financial institution who got in touch with the OR that stage to put them on notice that they decided that a certain amount of redress was, was due, and that's what led to the decision. Mm -hmm. but it, we would say there was, no, there was no complaint in that decision to the fact that the underlying eligible complainant made the reference. So th th there, are, there are numerous subtleties that can arise out of this, and again, to very gratefully adopt what Lord Justice Singh said, it, it is an illustration of the need for the sort of exercise that Lady Justice Arden regarded as, as appropriate, even if one comes back to the same questions at the end. They can be tested along the way, but the ultimate test is in relation to the, um, the provisions as a whole. Uh, at least for current purposes, it is, is enough to, um, to, by way of a, an immediate response to Lordship. Um, moving on in this 1.8, which is found on page 5. <coughs> um, this isn't a matter of dispute between myself and my friend. Uh, this says, if a respondent receives a complaint which is outside the time limits for referral to FOS, it may reject the complaint without considering the merits, but must explain this to the complainant in a final response in accordance with this 1.6.2, etc. So this, if you like, is, is the gateway to why we are looking at this 2.8. So 
because it's, it's the ability of the institution to reject on the basis of that the 2.8.2 time limits are not met. So th this uses the phrase must explain this to the complainant. Yes, it does. So turning then within tab 1 to page 10, Two point two point one G. The scope of the financial ombudsman service to jurisdictions depends on first the type of activity, see disciplines two point three, two point four, and two point five. Second, the place where the activity to which the complaint relates was carried on. Thirdly, whether the complainant is eligible. And fourthly, whether the complaint was referred to the financial ombudsman service in time. Now we we say these, these four elements are, are clearly interconnected. We saw them earlier on, put in one place, separated by semicolons. They together define the scope of the jurisdiction. And the court finds it helpful. They can be regarded as a, as a, as a composite. The complainant must be eligible to make a complaint about a relevant activity which took place within the territorial scope of the compulsory jurisdiction. And he must play, make the complaint in time. Um, a sign of a small point, but in, in relation to infelicity, although there's reference to DISP 2.4 in subparagraph 1, there is no longer any 2.4, as you may have noticed in your reading. <coughs> and we then turn to page 19. Is the complainant eligible? Two point seven point one. A complaint may only be dealt with under the Financial Ombudsman Service if it's brought by or on behalf of an eligible complainant. So it's that uh, contradistinction again, as I called it earlier. And uh, there is a small difference with the definition of a complaint, which you recall was from or on behalf of, but I don't suggest that there's any difference between from and by for these purposes. And that then leads into 2.7.2R. A complaint may be brought by or on behalf of an eligible complainant or a deceased person who would have been an eligible by a person authorised by the eligible complainant or authorised by law. It's immaterial whether the person authorised to act on behalf of an eligible complainant is himself an eligible complainant. Now, clearly that, that needs a bit of unpacking as a, as a throw at you, as, as, as it were. Um, first, it's solely dealing with situations where the complaint is brought on behalf of an eligible so it's identifying somebody other than the eligible complainant. Um, there is also the drafting infelicity of referring to somebody who would have been an eligible complainant if he wasn't deceased, because that seems to take a slightly different drafting approach to 2.7.1, which simply talks about eligible complainants. But it's clear, we would say, what the intention is. Sorry, I don't understand that. Could you just well, elaborate? So if you're dead, it seems to say you're not an eligible complainant, whereas 2.7.1. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. But having said that, it's, it's an infelicity because the, the intention is clear. Well, I'm not even sure it's kind to be drafted, described as an infelicity. 2.7.1 says you can bring it a complaint on behalf of an eligible complaint. 2.7.2 explains what that means. In the case of someone who's dead, obviously they're not actually a person anymore, but they're somebody who could have brought a complaint. 
thank you for letting us still alive. I don't, I don't myself see there's anything wrong with the drafting at all on that point. But there we are. The, the phrase authorised by the eligible complainant or authorised by law, uh, the, the first half of that appears, we would say, relatively straightforward in that it appears to envisage some sort of express authorization by the eligible complainant, as I've described, uh, who clearly remains the person so characterized as eligible complainant for the purposes of this 3.7. <coughs> choice of authorized by law uh, is suggestive, we would say, of a deliberate use of perhaps linguistic symmetry by the drafts person. Uh, beyond that, there are three immediate conclusions that one can reach by reference to the language. Uh, first, it, it appears to be intended to be a catch-all for any situation other than authorization by the eligible complainant. Secondly, authorized by law is certainly intended to cover the situation where there is a deceased person. And thirdly, on that basis alone, the language authorized by law isn't being used, used in some technical legal way. And we'd respectfully say that the sort of executors being authorized by law wouldn't be the natural language of a probate lawyer, for instance. But uh, it, it's, um, it's a generalized language. Um, in fact, we can go further, because as recorded by the judge, uh, it is common ground in this case that a trustee in bankruptcy would fall within the authorised by law phrase. That's paragraph 19 of the decision. So one then turns to 2.7.3, where it's stated that an eligible complainant must be a person that falls into one of a number of categories. And again, to pick up on Lord Justice, my Lord Lord Justice Nugi's point, it does uh, illustrate the difficulty because for this purpose, one has to identify the dead person as the eligible complainant, <coughs> notwithstanding the language in 2.7.2. The short answer may simply be it was felt to be clearer if they said expressly, even though he's died, he's still an eligible complainant. But syntax came out slightly differently. But whatever the position is, the eligible complainant dead or not, has to fall within 2.7.3. And relevantly, uh, it was agreed by the claimant in the other proceedings that the official receiver was not an eligible complainant and did not fall into any of these categories. And for your note, that's paragraph 70C of their slide. Supplementary bundle. As recorded by the judge, it wasn't or wasn't quite common ground with shop directs. The judge described the shop directors, shop directors having put it forward a tentative alternative analysis, uh, which had originally been floated in a footnote in its skeleton argument for the hearing below. Uh, the judge said it raised already without emphasis or prominence. That's uh, the judge at paragraph 61 to 63 of the judgment. And that was in relation to whether the official receiver was a trustee within the meaning of 2.7.3.4. So I show you that now as we go through. And it's obviously it's the subject of my friend's uh, respondent's notice here. So on that, <coughs> I'll, I'll see how my friend develops his points and I'll deal with that in reply if he's got anything further to say. In yes, so you, you dispute that the OR is a trustee of a trust? For, for this, within the meaning of this, yes, we do. And further, to be an eligible complainant, a person must have a complaint which arises from one of the relationships listed in DISP 2.7.6R. Found on the following page. 
To be an eligible complainant, a person must also have a complaint which arises from matters relevant to one or more of the following relationships with the respondent. So first, the complainant is or was a customer, etc. Secondly, the complainant is or was a potential customer. And there is a very long list. The, the list has grown over the years. Uh, but within the rest, all of which start with the word the complainant, I should show you five and six on the following page. Again, simply to save my friend the trouble of showing you those later because they rise in this context. We, we do say here, consistent with the, the, the overall scheme here, we say in each case, this can only be a reference to the eligible complainant. It's an obvious point that, um, that, that the, the nature of the scheme here, this is, this is all about whether you are the eligible complainant. And if you don't get through this, there simply is no relevant matter for consideration, either by the firm or by FOIA. Now, if any of these people are deceased, what's your submission about, for example, who the respondent is required to send a decision to? Well, in, in the circumstance that we say that the, the, the reading which makes sense for overall the provision is that you would send, for instance, if there are executives to the executive personal representatives, personal representatives. So I think during the drafting stages, the words personal representatives, I think, appeared at one stage yeah. in the consultation papers. So, so just, just, to, just to be clear on that particular point, or we were looking at it earlier, and we can go back to it if we need to, but, but we all remember the provision about having sent the complaint. Right, so you could have at least three scenarios, could you not? One is that the complainant has made the complaint, no problem, you send it to that person. Uh, second is, they no longer exist, because they're dead. You say, although it refers only in terms to the complainant, when read sensibly in its context and having regard to the scheme as a whole in the light of its purpose, it's obvious that you have to send this to someone who is, for example, the uh, personal representative. You could also have a pure agency situation. Uh, as it happens, in this case, we're dealing with bankrupt persons, but I'm not, I'm not dealing with those, because I'm trying to see what the rule means when read in its proper context. So if you have a non-bankrupt person, do you, do you, is it your submission? that it does no violence to the language of the scheme to say, well, if in fact the eligible complainant has authorised another person to make the complaint on their behalf, when the rule says you've got to send the decision to the complainant, well, read sensibly, that could mean send it to the person they authorise to act on their behalf. Have I understood your submission? My, my, my Lord, yes. And in, in daily life, I would respectfully say, let, let's say um, somebody wants to get in touch with one of my children. They might send a letter to me. And they say, I'll pass it on to my children. In that particular case, because my children are well, around and they're in the house with well, me. Well, that, that may be, uh, that may be right, <laughs> but it may be a, 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 a more difficult scenario. I think what you're saying is that you just start with a simple scenario where you've got, for example, client instructs solicitor. If you serve the decision on the solicitor, I'm not saying I agree with you, but your submission is that that's enough. That service on the complainant, if you have served it on their agent. Yes, my, my Lord, yes. And so, certainly we'd say that's simply about just an aspect of the general law that one wouldn't find it necessary to set out in a, in a provision like this. It's simply just how the world works. Yes, and then, and then the more difficult scenario, the one that arises, as it happens on this appeal, is what happens where uh, the uh, eligible complainant is a bankrupt and it's the OR who makes the complaint to the bank. And, and uh, just, just to pick up on an aspect of this, um, the, the particular things on which focus has been placed about <coughs> um, sending something to the complainant, that's we would respectfully 
say, to some degree, secondary, because it's about corresponding. It's not about the fundamental question of who is the eligible complainant. Yes, and you're, and you're right, it doesn't go to jurisdiction no. say, in the same way. So you've shown us the four criteria which need to be satisfied for it to go to jurisdiction. Yes. And, and, and also, Your Lordship and Your Ladyship have seen Section 226, and this is right at the heart of things, that if the complainant is eligible, so one, one's got to grapple with that uh, as a starting point in the, in the statutory hierarchy. But this is all to create a, a workable scheme in the way that financial services legislation is to be understood, but which focuses on saying, is that person eligible? Now, straight away, with the dead person, one's got to, to see an, an element of flexibility to the language. There's a, there's a, there's a pragmatism. We're not dealing with um, detailed capital gains legislation or legal settlement legislation. This is a practical regime about access in respect of the mis-selling of products to private individuals. And the paradigm case, and I, and I do respectfully adopt what your Lordship says here, that there is an assistance one gets from analysing the paradigm change and then seeing the other matters as having been bolted onto that. And they do throw up starting challenges. But we respectfully say that when you address those in the context of how the paradigm is meant to work, actually one can discern a way through to how the intention was that the legislation should operate. But as I say, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly, Jack. Mm. Well, I was going to say, does it come to this? That the paradigm case, the rules work perfectly well. The complainant is the consumer who was missold the PPI, or at any rate claims to be missold the PPI, and who refers it thus to the firm and then to Forrest. So there's only one person, and it's obvious who the complainant is in such a case. The difficulty arises, you've got two people. You've got the consumer who claims to have been missold the PPI, and you have the person, whether it's their PRs or whether it's the OR, or other trustee in bankruptcy, or agent, which may give rise to slightly different questions, who actually sends the document to the firm or to Forrest. And the difficulty is that sometimes, when you look at the word complainant, in order to make coherent and practical and commercial sense of the rules, it's got to mean the person who actually sent it. In the case of death, as you've accepted, you can't, under Rule 1.6.1, require the firm to send a dead person the acknowledgement or keep the dead person informed. It must mean the PR. And I think you accept, but, but I don't think you expressly. You, you might not have said so expressly, but in, in the case of your case, where the OR is the person who's actually referring the complaint, bringing the complaint on behalf of the eligible complainant, the bankrupt, again, it's obvious that for correspondence purposes, it has to go to the OR. It wouldn't be any good sending an acknowledgement to the bankrupt. It would be nonsensical. So what you have to do is, in these non-paradigm cases, you have to adapt the rules in a sensible and flexible and appropriate way, having regard to commercial coherence for making sense of the scheme. Is that, is that what it comes to? We, we, we would certainly agree with that, but we, we would give this, this gloss. But when you look at the, the way it's structured overall, that you do that by recognising that when it says send to the complainant, it still means the eligible complainant, but it is sufficient that it goes via the person who referred the complaint. Which is why a question I pose to you comes back again, which is you do say, even on the correspondence section, the complainant remains the consumer. Yes. All the way through. Yes. And, and you say if you take that as the thread that underlies all this, the paradigm case should be dominant. And what you describe as bolt-ons shouldn't distract from the underlying theme. M my lady has put it very well. That's what you say. Yes. <coughs> the complainant, you say, is the consumer. I think we all understand that shorthand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, you also say, I think, 
but the rules make it clear that they don't themselves have to refer the complaint because it uses the phrase or on behalf of. Yes, and to, to, to that extent, both a reference to uh, the terms we saw in the glossary, a particular reference to 2.7.1 and 2.7.2, which inform, we would say, how the rest of DISP is to be interpreted. But it's also, in a, de in a degree, it's a reference back to um, Section 226. Parliament created the situation where it said the complainant must be eligible. It developed DISP by the FCA and FOB um, at the same time as Section 226 was put in place. On a literal meaning, the complainant is eligible. That would appear to suggest that somebody who's no longer in being is not eligible. And if it's not suggested by anybody, in fact, this shows exactly the contrary, that it was intended they should be left out. This shows that it was the intention at the time that legislation was passed that that eligible complainant should nevertheless have access to the scheme. Now, if you like, that's a further illustration of where I was, where I was started drawing other elements of how this iterative and holistic process does does inevitably draw one in different directions. Mm -hmm. but, but so the, the, the essence is, uh, to answer my Lord, Lord Justice Nugent's point, that um, writing to the official receiver, for instance, is writing to the complainant because that is sufficient within the meaning of this to be writing to the eligible complainant. And that, that's, our, that's our submission as to how it works. And as I say, I'll, I'll hopefully um, elaborate that further, going through a bit more of the material. Yeah. Well, now you've got, I think, to <coughs> page 20 and the list of people there. Where, where are we going next? So we're going next to page 20. You'll see the heading. Was the complaint referred to the financial ombudsman service in time? But um, I can go, I think, bearing in mind the, the time to straight to 2.8.2 .2 on page 26, yes. which of course is ultimately where we all have to end <coughs> up. So uh, again, lots of defined terms. The Ombudsman cannot consider a complaint if the complainant refers it to the Financial Ombudsman Service more than six months after the date on which the respondent states that the complainant its final response, etc. And I showed you where final response came in earlier. And secondly, more than six years after the event complained of, or if later, three years from the date on which the complainant became aware, or ought reasonably to have become aware he had cause for complaint, unless the complainant referred the complaint to the respondent or to the ombudsman within that period and has a written acknowledgement or some other record of the complaint having been received. But then a carve-out, and I should show it to you, albeit it's not a matter of debate in the current proceedings, and the carve-out's in three, unless in the view of the ombudsman the failure to comply with the time limits was a result of exceptional circumstances. So on this legal question, nobody is making submissions to you on exceptional circumstances. Now, do, do, do you mind if we just, begin, before we get to <coughs> the crucial provision that in fact we're called upon to construe, it, it may be helpful if we look at paragraph one. Yes. <coughs> because that uses the word, the complainant. I just wanted to be clear what your submission is about what the complainant there means. Uh, um, my submission is the, the, the same as before. Here, this is about conveying to the complainant, I mean the underlying eligible complainant, its final response. <coughs> but if you have, for example, a situation where the eligible complainant is dead. And when you then, get then how are you supposed to comply when with you, this? Then when you get to the bolt-on stage, we say that 
taking this as a whole, what you are looking at is there is sufficient tending to the complainant if it is sent to the person who referred the complaint. Right. And, and would you say the same uh, will apply if, for example, it's a situation, not bankruptcy, but a more conventional situation where uh, the consumer has authorised another person to refer the complaint. Um, in that situation, would it be sufficient if the respondent sends its final response to the person authorised? Yes, and, and that, that we say is, um, that's a point I was going to develop shortly, but that is um, a, a critical factor in the way this should be understood, because actually when one looks at the way this 2.7.2 is drafted, starting point is somebody authorised by the eligible complainant to refer. And the natural thing in those circumstances, you don't bypass the person they've authorised. Sufficient compliance with 2.8.1 here to send it to that person, but it is still the complainant, the underlying complainant, eligible complainant, who is the focus. You're, but by doing it, by sending it to the agent, all you're doing is ensuring it gets to the person who appointed the agent. Well, that works in the case of true agency. Does it? It doesn't work in the case of theft, because as we all accept, you've got to adapt. The, ru the rules are written with the paradigm case in mind, and they're, they're not difficult to construe that case in mind. But you have to adapt the rules for the purposes of bolt-ons. And, and the most striking case is death, because as you've said, someone who's dead can't actually be a person who brings a complaint at all. But the rules treat the PRs who bring the complaint as bringing it on behalf of, of the dead person. Now, there obviously can't be agency in the real, normal, legal sense, because you can't be an agent of a dead person. But you, you have to adapt the rules. And in those circumstances, sending to the PRs is not only sufficient, but it's the only thing you can do. You can't send it to a dead person. What, what, uh, what one has to do clearly is to, to make coherent sense of the provision. And the, the, the challenge that presents itself is if one was to be dealing with a separate provision that was purely about dead people would be drafted differently. Yes. But the way, the way it's been drafted in 2.7.2 is that you've got to accept that the draftsman has anticipated you will be uh, working on the assumption that there is somebody who is defined as the eligible complainant and somebody else will be acting for or on behalf of them. Now, in relation to the agent, and that's the pure agency but it could be just somebody who's done something for somebody else. The obvious position, we would say, is that by sending anything to or from that person, you are sending it to or from the eligible complainant. Because their, their rights haven't been denied. They're sui juris. They, they may not have given away all their rights to this individual to completely run their affairs. It may just have been a convenience. So it's all about eligible complainant. Yes, in and that so sense, and somebody who is dead or bankrupt remains an eligible complainant. Yes, and even if they're dead. If, if the and and so we respectfully say it wouldn't be a coherent response to say in two point eight point two or two point eight point one. Oh well, in the case of agency, the complainant still remains the eligible complainant. But in the case of death, there's a switch to. Uh, personal representative. But, but I find this too, too absolute a way to read the rules. That If you just read the very first opening words, if the ombudsman cannot consider a complaint if the complainant refers it outside time limit, the complainant there, in the case of death, can't literally mean the dead person, because the dead person can't refer it. It must mean the executors or PRs on behalf of the dead person's estate. That's what it, it must be. Well, the, 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 pre, 
prism, if I can put it this way, that one looks through, we respectfully submit, is what this was chosen to do, and then try and work out what, yeah. what the effect of this was chosen to do. And a, a clear, we would say, legislative choice has been taken in this 2.7.2 to say that in those circumstances, somebody else is acting on behalf of. I entirely accept that. You, you have made the point, I don't think it's disputed, that this 2.7.2 expressly contemplates that dead people's complaints can be brought. But who actually does it, who actually refers it to the ombudsman, obviously it's the PR. I mean, it can't be anybody else. So when it says the ombudsman cannot consider a complaint if the complainant refers it, if you spell out what that means in, in the case of death, it means if the executors or administrators of the estate of a deceased person lodge a complaint on behalf of their deceased estate, that is what on behalf of means in this case, outside the time limit. Well, I don't see why you're having difficulty with that. That, that, that seems to me that, that must be giving <coughs> a sensible meaning what, what it means. Because otherwise you'd say there was no time limit at all in the case of a, of a PR bringing a claim. Well, we, we would respectfully say that um, what it means is a coherent single system, namely whatever situation you look to the individual. Um, it is the case that there are potentially open-ended time limits in this. And it was for that very reason, of course, that the 2019 fixed time limit was brought in to bring an end, a, 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 um, a resolution an orderly way to something that could have gone on for, for many, many years. And in those circumstances, especially when one bears in mind how the four elements were knitted together, deliberately knitted together within this, that's not, we would say, an irrational or illogical thing for a draftsman to have done, because it builds on the paradigm. It builds on the paradigm in a logical, single way, which means he knows all the time you're focusing on. Now, um, the, the danger is, I, I, I repeat myself, but I'm sure your Lordship has read my official submissions. Um, I do want to look at one or two other provisions before making some overall points. Yes, please. Um, and I may or may not finish that before the short adjournment. But I was going to say, I was going to circle back to 2.8.2 shortly. Uh, but uh, the first thing I was going to look at was uh, on page 28. Yes. Uh, and that's 2.8.9. And the reason I show you that, that is, that is the introduction of the time limit. So, so although it doesn't say in the margin, this was introduced in 2017 with a view to bringing the, the orderly resolution. When you say the time limit, the long stop. The long stop at the end of August 2019, yeah. yes. Yeah. When and was, when, sorry, when did you say the provision was brought in? This was brought in, I believe, on the 29th of August 2017. Yes. Okay. That's, that's what 1A suggests. Uh, yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, my recollection is that that was the subject of a claim for judicial review. And I don't think it matters, but I was the High Court judge who dismissed the case. You, your Lordship's awareness is therefore probably much more detailed than mine, but that is my understanding. Uh, well, yes. <coughs> yes, and, and perhaps I can elaborate on that slightly further. One can see that uh, from certain perspectives it might be said that it was still inappropriate to have any form of long stop cut off. From other perspectives, a long stop cut off was long overdue. And I mentioned earlier about the quid pro quo, and I, I put that that's as a, a general point rather than a, a legal submission. Uh, but but I, do, I do say it's, it's uh, I generally understood that in return for the long stop cut off, extensive advertising was necessary, and the industry indeed spent a huge amount of money supporting that extensive advertising, which again we're all familiar with. Yes. Now, the second thing I was going to refer to was Appendix 3, uh, 
That's found at page 39. Yes. So, as um, mentioned, this was this was introduced around 2010, and again was also in part the subject of an unsuccessful judicial review, uh, which isn't in the bundle. And this appendix sets out how a firm should handle complaints relating to the sale of a payment protection contract by the firm. And within that, various things I wanted to show you. But what I was focusing on, or plan to focus on, is the intense focus on how CPI is missold to the complainant. And within that, I'm not going to show you every passage, but there are numerous indications that what DISP had in mind about the mechanics was that the complainant was always the underlying customer. Uh, turning, for instance, to page uh, 40, one sees at the bottom the start of app. 3.1.2G. And looking to the next page, subparagraph 2, uh, determine the way the complainant would have acted if a breach or failing by the firm had not occurred. App 3.1.3G on page 41. At step 1, whether the firm determines there was a breach or failing. The firm should consider whether the complainant would have bought the payment protection contract in the absence of that breach or failing. This appendix establishes presumptions for the firm to apply about how the complainant would have acted. And in one, for some breaches, they should presume that the complainant would not have bought the payment protection contract. Uh, for certain of the others, in two, that the complainant would have bought a regular payment protection contract instead of the payment protection contract they they bought. Uh, 3.1.4G. There may also be instances where a firm concludes after investigation at step one that notwithstanding breaches or failings by the firm, the complainant would nevertheless still succeed. And step two, 3.1.4G. Uh, this is in relation to uh, unfair relationship situations under section 140A of the CCA. Yeah. Assess a complaint to establish whether failure to disclose commission gave rise to an unfair relationship. And two, determine the appropriate redress, if any, to offer to a complainant. And again, the, the focus is it's being offered to the underlying complainant. Now, this all applies whether that underlying complainant is dead or is bankrupt or is using an agent. Uh, reference in 3.1.5G, in 1A, uh, historic interest means the interest the complainant paid to the firm. And I'm not picking up every reference here, but let's go on to page 43, the assessment of the complaint at 3.2. You see in um, 3.2.3G, a firm may need to contact a complainant directly to understand fully the issues raised, even where a firm receives a complaint from a third party acting on complainant's behalf. So it recognises that it's sufficient communication, from what you've already seen, with the complainant to go through somebody acting on the complainant's behalf. Uh, 3.2.7, the firm should consider all of its sales to the complainant in respect of refinance loans. Now, similar references to the complainant come, come thick and fast, particularly pages 44 to 47 and 49 to 50, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to burden the court with reading all those out. Um, I would ask you to note that at 3.6.2 E, I'm confused my 
Chase names earlier, this was the, this was the subject of Critchley. <coughs> in the absence of evidence to the contrary, the firm should presume. Sorry, which page are we uh, on? Page now? 49, I apologise. Thank you very much. Yeah. The firm should presume that the complainant would not have bought the payment protection contract he bought if the sale was substantially flawed. And there's a long list of things about what happened <coughs> when the complainant purchased the policy. Non-disclosure, lack of explicit agreement, uh, non-disclosure of various sorts. And what happens under 3.6.2e if it's in the absence of evidence of the contrary, where failings have been identified, the burden in effect shifts to the firm. Indicative that in terms of the way the the scheme was put together, the drafting of the scheme, the protection of the consumer is important, the consumer being the weaker party to any bargain in the system. And so again, um, and it's very similar to the points I've been making already, but what one sees from this Appendix 3 is the purpose of giving access to eligible complainant to Oz and the, the eligible complainant's underlying complaint is what is dealt with. What was done then and evidential presumptions kick in, for instance, if there's no, no evidence that can be put forward on the other side. So it's in relation to that original underlying position. So it, it, it's exclusively concerned with that, that position, that relationship, and what's been said to that individual thereafter. So it's a, so it was at that point I was going to move to taking stock of where I've got to so far. I can begin <coughs> on that, and it's not quite one. I can, I can, I can begin. Yes. So it's been a fairly dense exercise, obviously, to get to this stage, and there, there is more to go. Uh, but I suggest that it it does cast light on the situation to examine the paradigm when no authorization uh, intrudes. And if one gives a serious element, one has a customer who's been missold PPI by a financial institution which was an authorized person at the relevant time. He's eligible because he falls within one of the categories in 2.7.3 and has a relationship that falls within DISP 2.7.6. He's eligible within the meaning of 226, therefore, because he's eligible within the meaning of 226, subsection 6, which is the cross-reference to the rule. FISMA provides the time, that there shall be a time limit. The time limit set out in DISP 2.8.2. That time limit just, justified it's judged by reference to his awareness. And if the financial institution does not reject this complaint, <coughs> it's dealt with according to Appendix 3, which focuses exclusively on the position of the eligible complainant and what happens vis-a-vis -vis the eligible complainant. That financial institution, just as much as FOS, must communicate its determination to the complainant, the eligible complainant. Now, we respectfully say that it is can be reasonably inferred that that paradigm is what was foremost in the minds of the drafters of FISMA and the handbook. So we test that further, and again I've, I've made some submissions in relation to that already, by looking at the second situation, which is where the complainant has a choice, he can either do it himself or he can get somebody to do it for him, on his behalf needn't be formal agency, although it may be. The focus is simply on whether that person is authorised to do so or not. Authorised isn't defined. And we say the position is exactly the same here as it is in relation to the paradigm. And critically, there is no reason of language or logic why one should complainant in 2.8.2 to 
be anything other than the eligible claimant. Somebody else is simply doing something on his behalf. And we respectfully say it wouldn't have made any sense to try and shift the limitation provision, which is expressed in very general terms. It's nothing like the sophistication that you might find in the limitation. The scope regime, 2.8.2, nothing to shift the natural position, the clear position, is the eligible can claim in this knowledge, which is relevant. And it is, of course, one of the four critical elements, which you need, we say, to tie together for what gives you access overall to the scheme. Were you about to finish? I'm nearly at the break. Just one more short paragraph. All right. Why don't you say what you have there? And we say that in those circumstances, on a sensible and practical reading, there's no difficulty about sending correspondence to the eligible complainant within the meaning of this by sending it to the person who referred the complaint on his behalf. That was the natural point. Okay. Please don't respond to this now, but you may want to think about it. I would like your help at some point about what follows from your submission about whose knowledge is relevant to the way in which time limits would work in this context. If you have, say, the following scenario, that let's just say that on the facts, the underlying consumer, who you say is the complainant, either knew or ought reasonably to have known, and therefore time was running, and more than three years had elapsed before the OR even comes on the scene. As I say, don't answer that now, but that may be one scenario that we'll have to think about. I would certainly like the parties' assistance on this. There may be other scenarios that we can use to test which must be the correct interpretation. I'd like to know what follows on your submission in that sort of scenario. Now, would it be convenient if we resume at the end of the argument? Yes, please. Thank you. 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 Thank